Welcome back to another segment here on GEMS Podcast. For those of you that are new to the community, welcome in. For those seasoned listeners, thank you so much for tuning back into another segment. With me today is a very special guest by the name of Dr. Michelle Maidenberg. And let me tell you a little bit more about who Dr. Michelle is. Dr. Michelle P. Maidenberg holds a PhD, MPH, and LCSW hyphen R and she maintains a private practice in Harrison, New York. She is also the co-founder and clinical director of Through My Eyes, a nonprofit 501c3 organization that offers free clinically guided videotaping to chronically medically ill individuals who want to leave video legacies for their children and loved ones. Dr. Michelle is an adjunct faculty at New York University, NYU, teaching a graduate course in mindfulness practice. How many of y'all need to be mindful? And the other cool part is um, Michelle, Dr. Michelle is the author of the book, Free Your Child from Overeating, 53 Mind-Body Strategies for Lifelong Health and She also has an upcoming book that will debut later this year around September, Ace Your Life, Unleash Your Best Self and Live the Life You Want. And it's going to be available for pre-orders at Thrift Books, Barnes & Nobles, Walmart, and Amazon. And Dr. Michelle recently did a TED Talk titled Circumventing Emotional Avoidance. She is also a blogger for Psychology Today. So without further ado, let's welcome the woman behind it all who wears many hats, but she knows what she's talking about. Dr. Michelle P. Maidenberg. Hi, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Dr. Michelle. And thank you so much for sharing and holding space. So we're going to jump into the connection part of the segment. And in this segment, there are two options for you to choose from. We could either do an icebreaker or a rapid fire 10 question game. Emphasis on rapid. (laughs) So what are you in the mood for? Okay. Hmm. I'm trying to be mindful. So I, I'm curious about the rapid fire, but I'm a little uh, nervous about it. <laughs> okay. Which one? Which one? You want to do rapid fire? Are you feeling well, frisky? I, I, I'm going to, I'm feeling the weekend's coming and that we should do something challenging. <laughs> Okie dokie. So here yes. we go. Okay. We're playing rapid fire with Dr. Oh. Michelle and Genesis. <laughs> do, 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 do. Question number one, favorite color? Uh, purple. Question number two, did you always know you wanted to be a doctor? Yes. Question number three, if you could trade places with anyone, would you trade places? And if so, with who? And if not, would you just remain yourself? I think I'd remain myself. (laughs) Question three, no, question four, if you could have any superpower, what would it be and why? Strength, definitely strength. Yeah, definitely, very strong. (laughs) Question five, if you could recreate or relive any significant moment in your life, what would it be? Um, I think my 20s. I, I don't know a moment, but I think just my 20s. <laughs> <laughs> Question. A lot of freedom. A lot of freedom. I want freedom. I want to I wanna be free. <laughs> like free as a bird, free as yes, a bird. <laughs> yes, yes. Question six. Okay, here's a good one. You just won the lottery. Cha-ching, cha-ching. However, here is the kicker. You must donate to three charities of your choice before the remainder of the proceeds are released. What three charities are you contributing to? Definitely my my nonprofit, for sure. (laughs) Because we're actually looking for funding. (laughs) So that's a really important piece. Most of it will go towards my nonprofit. Um, something that's trauma related. There's so much trauma going on right now in this world. I just feel like, yeah, I just need to support people who are kind of experiencing trauma. So definitely trauma related. And, you know, there was a, there was an article yesterday that I was reading about how many people around the world, how there's a food shortage. So I think I would definitely donate um, around the world, you know, for people to be, you know, 
nutritionally sound because that makes me really sad to think about that that people are starving all over the world amazing thank you for sharing those and we're on question number eight keep me honest here pregnancy brain is real so <laughs> <laughs> what's my excuse okay. anyway, yes <laughs> question eight yes whenever you first went to medical school did you have emphasis on what you were going to study or did you just know medical school was in your plan well so it's a phd so it's not medical but I, oh yeah sorry yeah, yeah. that's okay so um yes i always knew that i wanted to do something related to mental health um i, I knew i I feel like I was just born to do this. And I, I could tell you just one quick story, but when I was in um, high school, yeah, it was in high school, um, they had AP courses, advanced placement, and I took a psychology advanced placement course. And I ended up getting the highest grade on the AP. Um, and I won an award at graduation for it. And if I tell you, like you talk about significant moments, I literally felt like I won the Academy Award. I can't even tell you. I remember the feeling. I remember like just feeling so happy and proud that I won this award, particular award. So I I, I knew it. I felt it <laughs> from early on. That's amazing. And thank you for correcting me earlier. Yes. Oh. Um, a question, and I love how you said said that because it's like that gave you the inclining that you're like, oh, this is where I want it to go. Question. Yeah nine would you rather a dream car dream home or heck let's go big and have both oh both i mean that's like a no-brainer <laughs> and question 10 it is our pass or play question i do apologize for the noise in the background i'm in a shared space so question 10 it's pass or play and here are the rules if you pass our roles are reversed and you get to ask me a question if you choose to play i ask one last question to wrap up rapid fire so do you want to pass or play play okay dokey so my last question for you what is your favorite food oh um it's sort of uh i would say things with these well foods with these things in it although i don't eat them very often but anyway i love peanut butter i love coconut <laughs> i don't really eat things with them but i i do love them like you know the with those flavors those tastes i would say yes but i don't know that i have a favorite food i'm trying to think like a, i don't know that i have a favorite food or what about a favorite cuisine uh, oh you know what i love artichokes i really love artichokes maybe that's it yeah okay I would, I'll, I'll i'll stick to artichokes <laughs> all right amazing well thank you for playing rapid fire so that concludes our connection part of this segment um audience i hope you got to learn a little bit more about dr michelle now we're gonna dive in to the work that she's currently doing and we're gonna hear more of michelle dr michelle's back um back end story because it's the back end story that led her to what she's doing now so Dr. Michelle, give us a synopsis of how you got started. I know you alluded to some of it in the rapid fire, but I wanna lay the foundation because it's so important, not just to focus on your arrival and where you are now, but to go beyond the surface level so the audience is able to connect with you. Yes. So you're talking about my history, like my personal history? Yes, you okay. could. Yes, you could share a bit of your personal history okay. because, and the reason why I feel like, like sharing this okay. Yeah. is because it builds up to the work that you're doing, the 501c3 nonprofit, you helping people overcome their trauma and et cetera. Yeah. So, you know, as an example, right before we got on this call, I, I felt very personally activated in myself. And, you know, right when I got on with you, I, I like had to take a deep breath and say like, wow, I really need to transition because I had such an intense session it was actually a double session so that even gives you a little bit of an inkling with somebody who experienced like a tremendous tremendous amount of trauma i mean from we're talking about infancy literally like until today and you know just and she told me her story like throughout the time we were with each other and the complexity of it and the intensity of it was just like whew, 
you know, mind blowing, you know, that one person could go through so much in their lives is just like unconscionable. So what, what leads me to doing what I'm doing and yes. Can I, can I ask one question? So you mentioned that she started with her childhood and her infancy. Was she struggling with ACEs, like adverse childhood experiences? I would have to say like, if she went through the ACEs, she'd probably get like a score of like at least eight to 10. I mean, oh, wow. really, we're talking about like, like a substantial amount of trauma on every level, really on every level. Um, and what was beautiful about her, I mean, she's, she's a beautiful person, of course, but what was so beautiful is that she's recognized that it's really impacting her in her adult life. And specifically in terms of forming healthy, nurturing relationships. And, and I said to her, you know, one thing I said to her is you matter. Like I, when I, when I, when we were kind of closing afterwards, I said to her, first of all, and she told me she's never told anybody her story. So, yeah, I mean, so I, I said to her, I said, I want you to know that I'm so honored and I feel so privileged that you're trusting enough, you know, and desiring enough to live a feeling, you know, thriving life that a that you would be so vulnerable right and also that you are trusting me with your story like I am so honored and I really you know I, I welled up in tears because it really is an honor for me for somebody to be trusting me with all of you know that pain and conf confidence you know Absolutely. And one thing I want to uh, share here before you jump into the, what you were about to say before I asked my clarification was that when some people are going through trauma that stems from childhood, they're carrying that with them into adulthood. And it's because they don't want to be judged. They don't want to feel that shame, that guilt or remorse. So they internalize it for so long. But when you internalize it for so long, if you don't deal with something, it doesn't get healed. And then you wonder why in your adult years you're dealing with some of the ramifications of certain things but it's because you never address the root cause of the problem because if you relive it that could be triggering and the hurt and etc could be there but the fact that she confided in you she felt safe and she was in a safe space but I also want to let the audience know that sharing your story is not a sign of weakness it's a sign of strength because then you're going through a pruning process and a purging process because you're letting go of some of that toxicity that is stem from mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually in order for you to feel free and be liberated. So I know you're, you're a doctor. I'm definitely not a doctor, but um, I definitely wanted to just put that out there and let me know if that is accurate or inaccurate. Yeah. And I, I think just to piggyback what you said, which is really critical, trauma gets really kind of if, if it gets integrated and it gets fused with our neural networks okay so the way we walk talk and really you know function in our world is with this information and the information unfortunately right because think about it you're getting it kind of transmitted through all different age so you're at a different place developmentally too so the way that you're processing it is very different than how you would press it as an adult, right? So we rely, we can't help it because that's what happens. So it, be, it becomes sometimes distorted and it becomes convoluted and, you know, it could go on and on, right? And it does get also, unfortunately, it gets stuck, you know, in our senses. So we could have very visceral reactions in our nervous system, right? In our, in our kind of senses, our smell, our taste, et cetera. So um, we can't, and, and unfortunately, our brains, our minds, and our bodies all hold on to negative stimulus, um, not positive. <laughs> so unless you clear it, or unless you work on it, and you process it, and you understand it, um, it unfortunately, definitely, definitely gets evoked you know, throughout our lives, and especially, like, especially with interpersonal relationships in certain areas of our lives. It affects our confidence, how we see the world, you know, how we function in, you know, in the world. Um, and I could go on and on. I love that. And I'm glad you piggybacked off of that because I just wanted to kind of share from the outside looking in what I've, what I've seen and what I've experienced and then have you who has actually studied in it 
um, mm -hmm. either validate what I said or, you know, add more value to it to just show the audience from an educational standpoint, but also as an eye opener, because they may be going through something similar, but they may not feel like they have that right person to talk to about mm -hmm. it. So I, I love that you brought that point up. So I'm going to let you dive, dive back in because you were un unraveling yes. uh, more of your journey. <laughs> Yeah. So the one point that I wanted to bring up with this particular person and why it was so profoundly sad, and then I'll kind of wrap around back to myself, is, you know, she talked about having such um, difficult relationships with her formative caretakers, her parents, right, because of, you know, certain issues with them. And then she finally found somebody in her life who she really trusted and um, allowed herself to be vulnerable. And then she was abused, you know, and taken advantage by that person. Um, and it goes on and on, right? So, um, you know, which was really profoundly sad. So the point that I'm making is that, you know, the trauma and the abuse and whatever it is, and not everybody obviously experiences that, you know, but I also wanna say that we all experience trauma to some extent. There's little T's and there's big T's, okay? And we have ruptures in our life. We do, we all have ruptures to a different extent, different levels, but it's important to really recognize that within ourselves, that there are challenges you know, that we all experience. And that's why I say that um, anyone could use therapy or could use guidance, support, you know, because we all have these ruptures. So going back to myself, I unfortunately have intergenerational trauma um, from my, stemming from my grandparents. All four of my grandparents were Holocaust survivors. Yeah, and they were all, um, talk about trauma, but most of their families, all four of them were murdered, um, you know, in, um, in Europe, in Czechoslovakia specifically, but, so they came to this country, you know, with literally the shirts on their back and having no family and no foundation um, and had to really reinvent themselves. And you could imagine, okay, and they were, they were in their late teens. Um, you can imagine how that could have impacted them. Um, and it unfortunately then carried on to my parents and et cetera. You were gonna say something, yes. Wow. Um... That is a profound part because sometimes people don't focus on the intergenerational trauma and look at the family lineage to trace back what are some of the root causes and have these root causes and underlining problems been persistent that we've never dealt with that subliminally end up getting passed on because whatever you don't address gets dismissed or it doesn't show up until later on in life. And then you're wondering why your child is acting a certain way. Why is this person behaving this way or et cetera? But no one sat down to have these open, honest dialogue conversations because when you go through trauma, who wants to relive that hurt? Let's be real, real here. And trauma is going to look different for everybody. And like you mentioned, intergenerational trauma is going to look different than emotional trauma or the trauma of losing a loved one that is close to you that spirals you down this grief journey, or maybe even um, racism. Racism is very traumatic. There's so many different layers and elements to trauma, but I like that you brought up intergenerational trauma because then you're, you're, it's like a tree and the tree has the roots. And in order for that tree to really be grounded, the roots have to, you know, go deep. And until somebody is willing to go below the surface level and uncover those things that have been compiled on for years and years, then are we truly healing as a family unit, as an individual, or even I'll even say as a society as, mm -hmm. as a whole? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it gets passed down from generation to generation. And it's interesting you, you mentioned racism because I was thinking about that as I was talking too, because, you know, one thing that I hear and it's, which is so unfortunate, um, but, you know, and I hear this also, even when people talk about the Holocaust, you know, and, and just can people get over it? It happened so many years ago. Like, can we just move on from it? Like, it's not our fault that that happened. We, we didn't do it. It was our kind of forefathers or whatever. No, 
no, that's not how it works. You know, like we can't get over these things and it gets the, the trauma, the remnants of the trauma gets passed on from generation to generation. I could tell you third generation from my grandparents, right? It's so clear to me. It's so clear to me how it got passed down to my parents and then got passed down to me. And I am doing my darndest that it does not get passed down to my own children, you know, but I could tell you that I see it in other parts of my family where it has passed down, like all the way down the lineage and it's at risk for getting passed down even further. And I see that all the time. So we can't just forget. That's the point. Trauma leaves scars. We can't just forget. It doesn't work that way. So from your experience and working in the field that you work in, how can we help to help people to hold um, themselves accountable and those who are close to them on really talking about the traumas in a way that is um, conducive, not in a way that is, you know, judgmental or pointing the blame or shame or guilt or any other forms of emotions that they may tie to it because you said you're doing your darnest, but I think it each starts with us as an individual working on ways that we could be a solution and bridge the gap. Because if you leave it up to somebody else, nothing may get done because we've all heard the sentiment, like you said, oh, that happened so long ago or whatnot. But whenever you hear those statements, they could be re-triggering and it could show as if you are dismissing what someone is saying. And it's very relevant to that individual because it's experience that they've either have a close tie with personally or, or you know, removed if that makes sense. And feel free to clarify yeah. what I just said so it can make sense. Yeah, it, it did make sense. But <laughs> I think what you're speaking to also is it, is it comes off, off as being insensitive, you know, and it lacks empathy and compassion. And, you know, <laughs> whether, if you think about it, just logically, when we're hurt or when we feel pain, all we want as a person in a society is to be validated and to be heard and to be understood. So when that doesn't happen, there's a lot of anger and frustration and sadness and disappointment, and I could go on and on and on, right? Um, and that, that actually, if anything, takes away from the healing. It really does. So I think, I think you know, forging, like you said, those kind of relationships where you're able to be like affirming and validating is like so, so, so critical. Um, I, I'm trying to think if there was a second part, you know, to your question, um, did I respond to that? Yeah, no, no, yes, you did. Dr. Michelle, you responded to it. I know. Cause I wanted to put the context there, but then I also put a question in there as well. Yes. Yeah. So, um, just going back to what I was saying about, you know, kind of how it shows up again, you know, so, you know, going back to my own personal history, I was very fortunate and I think that has to do with my temperament and whatever the case is, but I, I learned from early on, you know, kind of the difference or being able to process like kind of what works and what doesn't in terms of my emotionality, because I happen to be, you know, a very, very deeply sensitive, emotionally sensitive person. And I'm, I consider myself an empath. Um, so, you know, I naturally had that intuitively. I was lucky and fortunate. I consider myself fortunate in that way. Not everybody's like that. So, you know, I'll just give you an example. My brother who, you know, we're 13 months apart, but he, he tends to be, I think, um, and he might argue with this, but he tends to be a little bit, I think, more cut off from his emotions, you know, or I could look within my family in general, like everybody kind of reacts differently and emotionally differently, right? Some people are a lot more kind of in touch and some people, you know, and again, I, part of the Ted talk that I did is circumventing emotional avoidance is we are wired and socialized to avoid our negative emotions. And we are constantly, constantly in a position where we do that. Now, the person who I brought up before, the thing that shows up for her, and this is kind of an example of how trauma impacts us, is she had very spotty memories of certain parts in her life. And it was very obvious from the spottiness 
that she would literally disassociate or cut off her feelings in order to survive. It was a survival mechanism. It was a coping skill. And again, we could judge it in whatever the case is, but she needed that to survive. Um, and then she talks about now in her relationships that when she feels threatened or something's not working for her, she'll just cut relationships off. This is a good point you brought up because you could see this in can marriages. You can you hear me now? Yes, yes. This is a good point that you brought up because we often see this sometimes in marriages whenever there is a disagreement and versus talking about it from a adult standpoint where each person gets a chance to speak and be heard, one person will shut down and they shut down because they don't want to deal with, deal with this situation. Kind of like with a person who is going through trauma, they're going to shut it down or they're going to block it off block it out because they're trying to be in their fight or flight mode. And in order to, you know, just survive, in order to just survive, it's best if they just kind of put it on the back burner or they put it so far back they, that they can't even remember what happened. And then whenever well, our, our bodies do that, like it's our natural instinct, you know, our bodies are kind of wired that way. You know, we're always in survival mode. Mm -hmm. Right. And our bodies do all different kinds of things to secure our safety. Now, when I say safety, right, it's safety because sometimes we really do need the safety and sometimes we don't. And even when we don't, we still use those same, same coping mechanisms. Mm. So instead of like working it through with somebody that she has a relationship with, she would be more apt to just cut it off. Right. Because in her, again, in her script and her narrative, uh, it never works out. People aren't trustworthy, right? Et cetera. That's her narrative. So she kind of takes that along with her in her future relationships. So we have to be, we just have to be careful that, you know, what our particular narratives are too, in, in terms of how we're entering the world. Yeah. So the question here, a follow-up question. So how do you get that individual to see what their narrative is so we can begin to debug it and descript it so they can learn when certain things are showing up that they need to switch gears or switch their paradigm so, they, so they're not just in that survival mode, but then we get them in that mode where they're thriving. Yeah, so for me, the way that I work with people, and again, it's not only with trauma, it's, you know, people have all different kinds of things that they come to see me for. Um, so what I do, it's, it's really kind of a multi-systemic, I'm going to say, um, approach because I'm working with the minds, which is really critical, obviously. Uh, we can't believe everything we think, you know, our mind again goes to a place of always trying to secure comfort and safety. Okay. So, you know, I, I write, there's a whole chapter in my book about this, um, and then what ends up happening, right? So, so it's, it's really, really getting a psychoeducation about your mind and how your mind works, okay? The second part of it also is understanding how our body works, okay? So there's a new type of, um, it's not so new in the, like 1990s, but uh, it's, it's really getting more, I would say, more familiar with clinical practice, you know, which is called polyvagal theory, which works directly on our nervous systems. And I've been doing a lot of work around that lately, um, but how our nervous systems are wired. Like, do we go into that kind of um, ventral vagal space, which is kind of connection, you know, do we go into, right, the, you know, the sympathetic space where, like you said, it's like the fight or flight, or do we go to the dorsal vagal, which is like shut down and disconnect, right? Um, and we do, we weave in and out of those states, uh, but how do we get back? into our ventral vagal? How do we get to that state of like connection, which is really hard when we're activated in a really profound way, whether it's with anxiety or whatever. Um, so I really teach people, I teach people how to act in a mindful way, how to process feelings, how to be in their bodies, right? Understand when they're being triggered, right? How that's impacting them, how it may impact their behavior what their core values are, how to act in a mindful way, keeping their core values in mind, right? So there's a lot of work that we do to help them really come to a place where they're being their best self and living the life they want. Um, because many people walk around in a fog, 
with a lack of self-awareness, with a lack of, you know, they're living in their subconscious or unconscious and they're really not in their presence awareness. So it takes, and we don't even realize when we slip into that, by the way, because 95% of the time we're in our, we're actually not in conscious awareness. Okay. We kind of, again, we go on autopilot. Um, so like if you're driving to the grocery store or you're doing something, you're not thinking about what you're doing. You're doing what you do every day. It's like rote. Okay. So could you imagine our mind is constantly slipping into that subconscious place. So we have to really work intentionally on being kind of in conscious awareness. And that takes a lot of commitment and a lot of effort and a lot of work, you know, that could lead to a very, very, very fulfilling place. If you're willing to be invested in it. Yeah. And sometimes it, it is hard to like change whenever you're so stuck in the routine. And whenever you begin to change, I've heard other people that came on the podcast that said, you know, your, your body wants to retreat back to the same way of doing things because yeah. it's been stuck in that paradigm for so long that mm -hmm. it's uncomfortable. And what feels comfortable to you is that place of complacency because it's your safe haven place. But the minute that you try to do something that is different than that, mm -hmm. it's like, these limiting thoughts, these beliefs, or sometimes people um, have even talked about the imposter syndrome will start to creep in and tell you, you can't do that. Why are you, why do you think that you're capable? And you'll hear these, you know, this negative chatter in your head. And then you begin to question yourself or doubt yourself when if you would just stay focused and look at what's in front of you and kind of like just I would, I like the way I say it is I tell my ego, like there's negative Nancy is a negative ego and positive Pat, Patty is a positive ego. I was like, okay, if that negative Nancy is talking that day, I tell her negative Nancy, sit down and shut up because positive Patty is here and she has something to say. So it's like kind of checking your thoughts in a sense. But if someone is not aware of that, they may not do that. So then they're stuck in the rat race or the rut longer than expected, unless they go seek out the help of a professional that can help them unpack certain things. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And like I said, anybody could use that help. I mean, you know, I think about like what an advantage it would have been for me. Like when I was younger, you know, I, I didn't start going, you know, kind of seeing a therapist myself till I was in my twenties, but like if I was a child and I had a chance to do that, that would have been so, so helpful for me. Um, but, you know, I think there's also really good ways. There's so much out there right now, you know, on mindfulness, like I said, even on polyvagal theory, there's a great book that I recommend to, you know, my patients, it's called Anchored by Deb Dana, which really works, you know, very specifically on, on our nervous systems, which is wonderful. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot out there that you could utilize and really, really help, you know, help you to thrive. Um, and foster positive relationships. So one other question I want to ask before we jump into the um, CTA, and I'm going to throw you an audible too before that. Um, I know some people who specialize in the same line or similar line of work as you, some people have mentioned using NLP, Neuro Linguistics Programming, CBT audience, that's cognitive behavior therapy. I've heard people talk about hypnosis, not the woo-woo kind guys, but another way that you could use hypnosis as a mod modality to help, you know, people uncover some blockages and overcome those traumas and stuff like that. Do you factor any of that into the practice and the work that you're doing, Dr. Michelle? Yeah. So I use, I have advanced training in CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, acceptance and commitment therapy, which is called ACT, which is wonderful work. It's kind of a mindfulness-based CBT. Um, I also do EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization reprocessing, which if you notice back here, there's like a light bar. So I use that in my practice as well. Um, I'm doing a lot of, I do a lot of mindfulness work, um, mindfulness-based work, and I teach a mindfulness practice class, a graduate class at NYU. So I teach practitioners how to use it in their practice, which is really wonderful work. And then um, I do a lot of also, like I said, the polyvagal theory, which is Stephen Porges's work, um, which is really working directly on our nervous systems that gets activated, you know, when we're in those kind of states. So it's a combo. It's really a combination. It depends on 
everybody has different needs. So it really, I use a kind of a smattering of those depending on, on an individual's needs. Perfect, and thank you for clarifying that. And now I'm throwing you an audible. Is there anything else that I didn't ask you that you wanna state that would add value to the conversation before we jump into the CTA, the call to action part? Mm, I don't think so. I think you got it all covered. <laughs> Amazing. Well, let's jump into the call to action, Dr. Michelle. What is your call to action for the audience once they just heard this segment? I know we covered a lot of material in a short period of time, but I also wanted to make sure that it was educational where they're thinking about it and we get those neurons firing. So they'll be like, oh, maybe I need to look into that. Oh, I didn't think about that or et cetera. Because what good is putting out content if we're not holding them accountable where they're actually applying what they heard and learned? Yes. So uh, in terms of a call to action, um, I, you know, I think, like I said, I think it's really, really important that, um, you know, everybody really takes time to challenge themselves um, and do, do what's maybe uncomfortable. So I do want to say that a lot of the work that I'm also focusing on right now, you know, which is kind of the acronyms of my book, ACE, which is Acceptance, Compassion, and Empowerment. So one of the things that I have to, that I find that has been, you know, so challenging, and I know it's challenging for myself as well, is self-love and self-compassion. Um, and, you know, the reason why we thrive, the reason why we engage in self-care, the reason why we are our best selves is because we really love ourselves and we really see ourselves as somebody who matters and I can't say that enough and when I say that to people when I, even when I'm talking to somebody and I, I look at them right at the end of I, I do guided meditations on YouTube and I always end off my guided meditation with I believe in you wholeheartedly and unconditionally that's like my little tag but I, I could tell you like people I've heard people say to me oh, it feels a little uncomfortable when you say that, like that you believe in me, like you do, you know, right? <laughs> like what expectations do you have? Like, or, right, or, or, if, or if I say you matter, I said, you, you know, even when I was talking to that person that I told you, I said to her, I go, you've decided that you matter, you know? And like, just even, I'm saying it now and I actually feel it in my body when I say that like how empowering that is to really feel on a deep fundamental level that you matter. So I think there has to be so much more work out there cultivating this like self-love and self-compassion. You know, um, th there was somebody just last week that was telling me that she had a t-shirt that said, um, I love myself. And which I love, by the way. If I saw somebody wearing that, I'd be like, you are cool. You know, um, I wear t-shirts that say warrior and like stuff like that, but I love myself. Like how cool. Yeah. And she said that, that like she's, people were giving her looks <laughs> like, how could you wear a t-shirt like that? What do you fool yourself? Who, who do you think you are? But I'm like, no, everybody should be, everybody should be wearing a t-shirt like that. I want to see that freaking t-shirt on everyone. <laughs> and I want them to like, I want them to stand proud when they wear that t-shirt. <laughs> That's what I want to see. I want to see a society and a culture that advocates self-love. And I have yet to see that. And it really makes me sad, I have to tell you. It, it's also because society has programmed us not to be so full of ourselves or conceited or arrogant or whatnot. So I'm sure whenever they were looking, people are like, side-eyeing her or like who does she think she is like does she think that she's snarky or whatever the comments may be instead of celebrating say I'm so glad that you love yourself and you know who you are and you know your worth that's and that's where the empowerment comes in but for someone who's thinking with a negative paradigm or is thinking thinking they're like oh man, she's full of herself or she's boastful or she's pride or whatever. But that's the way that society has conditioned us over yeah. time. And then we end up walking into that. And then, then we start making those preconceived judgments and notions and et cetera. None of us are perfect. We've all been there where we have judged someone, but when we've learned right from wrong, we're able to do better. 
if you know better, you do better. And exactly. unless you have these, these type of real raw coffee chat style conversations, we're not pushing the needle forward. And that's why I do my show the way that I do. I don't edit it. It's unscripted. And you could tell the audience this, like we didn't talk uh, before, like to plan this out, because I want people to really submerge themselves in this conversation and grab the meat and potatoes and then apply it. Yes. And you said your ACE um, is part of your book and it stands again for acceptance, compassion, compassion and empowerment and empowerment. So, yes. And, and the, the, I mean, why I'm so proud of it, I have to tell you is that it, it's, it's kind of separated into parts. So the first chapter really talks about our thinking, which is what I shared with you. Our, the second chapter is all about our values and how to assess our values, which is very critical. And then it's split into three parts, acceptance, compassion, empowerment. So the first part of each chapter talks about what gets in the way of us cultivating those things, which is just as critical as learning how to cultivate it. And then the second part of the chapter talks about how to cultivate it, like what you can do proactively to cultivate it. Thank you for sharing that and breaking it down because I think it's going to be value added. So Dr. Michelle, pl please plug your website and let oh. the audience know where you primarily hang out on social media. And sure. I will have all this linked in the show notes. Thank you, Thank you so much. So my website is my name. It's um, Michelle Maidenberg. Dot com, which is two L's, Michelle, and Maidenberg is M-A-I-D-E-N-B-E-R-G. Um, you can find a lot of information. All of my Psychology Today blogs are on there, you know, all my social media. Um, and then, of course, I would love for you to buy my book that's coming out September 20th, which is very exciting. Um, I just look so forward to, like, really birthing it. <laughs> which you could relate to, um, because I just, I see the transformation, you know, that it, I see the transformation that it makes and really, really helps improve people's lives. And I really want to share that with the world so badly because I want everybody to benefit. Like that is such a strong conviction of mine, you know, advocacy, you know, both for health, mental health and well-being. So I, I'm excited about that. Amazing. And thank you so much. And congratulations on the upcoming book. I love supporting authors since I'm one um, as well. Audience, make sure you like, comment, follow, and subscribe. This will be on 40 plus audio platforms. You could also see the recording to this by going to our YouTube channel and typing in GEMS, G-E-M-S, with Genesis Amaris Kemp. And lastly, but not least, where would I be without my supporters? You know, I only think about you. I just like to have fun. No, I am not a singer, but I want to thank you for supporting the subject matter experts that come into the community to share their expertise and to also curate and push the, push the movement and the mission of the podcast forward, which is to bring content that is educational, inspirational, and motivational while we also intersect diversity equity, inclusion, and belonging, because it takes all of us creating that imprint in order to drive an impact for each one of us to be world changers by tapping into our own truths. So my big ask, ASK, is for brand sponsors. If you would like to link arms with me and continue this mission, where you'll also find out that this podcast is currently ranked in the top 2% globally out of 2.8 million podcasts per the metrics on www.listennotes.com is where you'll find those KPIs. I would love to have you become a brand sponsor. You can find more info by going to genesisamarskemp.net or sending me a personalized email to genesisamarskemp at gmail.com because it does take resources to continue to propel the mission and the movement. And I would love to have you. So until the next guest, next segment, Go out there and learn more about yourself. When you do the work internally, then you're going to be able to manifest and materialize things externally once you have uncovered certain blockages. So until then, peace, love, and lots of blessings. Have yourself an amazing day.